Okay, welcome everyone. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this week's Oxford Centre for Tropical Forests seminar and to introduce our guest speaker, who is Marion Pfeiffer, who is reader in landscape ecology at the University of Newcastle. And Marion did her PhD at Jena in Germany and then postdocs in Potsdam and then in the UK at UCL and at York before doing a, a larger postdoc at Imperial uh, with Rob Ewers and the, and the SAFE project in Borneo. And uh, since then, uh, Newcastle has particularly been developing this research landscape in Tanzania that you'll be hearing about uh, today. So thank you for presenting to us, Marion, and over to you. Thank you. I'll try to share this. Is that visible for everyone? That's good. Excellent. So hello, everyone. I know it's afternoon, late afternoon. I'm preparing for my fish and chips dinner tonight. So I <laughs> appreciate you taking the time coming. Um, and thank you to Jadvinder and Shane for inviting me. So what happened in the last two and a half years, perhaps, I have been leading some research, a new research that uh, is happening in tropical landscapes, tropical rural landscapes. And we have been trying to look at the ecological processes and dynamics and also at the social processes and dynamics and trying to integrate them in the systems approach. So this is the first time we are presenting on that and showing some of that and new research is a great opportunity. Um, what you see here on this first slide is some pictures from our case study landscape in Tanzania. You can see it's, it's a very complex landscape, there's trees, there is uh, lots of croplands, there's lots of people and wildlife and uh, they interact in complex pathways and understanding the dynamics for their management is quite important. So we, let me just see that that works. Ah. I'm trying to go to the next slide, it might take a while. Let me go out for a moment. Hmm. I do a lot of teaching. <laughs> so <laughs> um, this is the first time that happened. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's a project in itself. If you follow me on Twitter, you will have heard about it. So it's called Acrisis Tanzania. Um, and the full title actually is What to Plant, When and Where Restoring Tropical Landscapes for Biodiversity and Human Wellbeing. So that was a big title and it's it's led by Newcastle, but it's actually a large scale uh, collaboration between different uh, institutions in the UK and internationally. So we have National Museums of Kenya in there, so Cornell University of Agriculture, SQI, uh, University of Leeds, and uh, an NGO that's Reforest Africa that sits in Tanzania and the University of Sunshine Coast in Australia. Um, and the research fits into uh, wider big hot topic and that is uh, global restoration opportunities and priorities so you will have seen probably one of these big papers right published in nature and science in recent years on on the global potential for tree restoration or global opportunities for tree restoration and these have been quite you know nice papers um, to some extent trying to look at carbon outcomes carbon benefits biodiversity benefits from global tree restoration um, and, and the latest paper by Strasbourg et al. also tried to uh, include some implementation costs for restoration into their analysis and especially delineating where we should focus restoration on in terms of space. And they have received their fair criticism, uh, a fair share of it. The first one was more technicalities on, is it really that much carbon that you can restore or is that really the best place for trees to go? Isn't it better to retain that grassland? The questions like that. There are some technical issues about the biodiversity data we have been using, but more importantly is um, their aspect of human well-being and likelihood of local communities. So there have been increasing increasingly louder voices of social sciences and political ecology. And they have highlighted that these papers that are coming out at the global scale, they often have these livelihoods and opportunities for people or as a cost for people as a tech on, where it's only considered relevant after we have specially delineated where we should restore. And that it's only important in terms of considering how to then actually restore the landscape, where you then start 
including communities in the process of restoration. And uh, these voices, these critical voices believe that might be the wrong approach. And they suggest some alternative routes on how to do that. So that's where the big uh, picture is around the research project that we are doing. And I will showcase uh, here in, in the following slides, some of the challenges that when it comes to the restoration process, including people and also including biodiversity and carbon outcomes, identify some solutions that we feel uh, could be used and, and I will introduce our systems approach framework for that, that is quite new. Then I will show how we have applied it and how it could be applied uh, before uh, looking forward uh, in terms of how can you plan restoration priorities, not just at local scale, but at larger spatial scales as well. And should that be a bottom up or top down approach? So in terms of um, the context setting, so why, what are the challenges? We, we of course know there are the SDGs and uh, we are, there are these targets for 2030 where we want to achieve all these different things from, from human health, better human health, better air quality, biodiversity outcomes, uh, climate change mitigation. We've always complex targets and they are interrelated and um, uh, some of them we can achieve, some of them will, there will have to be trade-offs to be made. And uh, the argument uh, from our side as, as natural scientists, ecologists, of course, that nature-based solutions might be sustainable solutions to interrelated challenges when it comes to, say, food security, climate change, and biodiversity. And uh, this could be achieved, for example, by uh, planting trees, agroforestry solutions, thinking about uh, preparing crop production landscapes for climate change extremes, for droughts, potential um, uh, drought tolerant crops, and stuff like that. Um, in terms of uh, if we say, okay, if you use nature-based solutions and they focus on natural habitats like trees uh, 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 in the last, I, I don't know, maybe five, 10 years, there is this really focus on forest landscape restoration as a systematic approach to that, to that um, uh, design of landscapes and the restoration of natural habitats within the landscapes. And uh, within FLR, I will use abbreviation, I think most of the time now, <laughs> is uh, uh, they want to look to reverse the ecological impacts of the land degradation, but also enhance human well-being. And that's not like, you know, that's not really new and, uh, uh, and uh, something I would come up with, like, right, this is well-established and it's led by Robin Justin and Petro Pankalion, who have been co-authors on some of these global restoration opportunities papers. And what has uh, been uh, coming up more recently as a big challenge is how, how you would use FLR to address uh, the interrelated outcomes, not just for biodiversity and ecology, but also for the human well-being, uh, in particular in landscape that are used for crop production. And food security is an important issue in the future, and there's different questions to be asked on how we should design or manage crop production landscapes to, to have enough food, to have uh, resilient food systems, and whilst also meeting targets on well being and biodiversity. And here I point out that a lot of the rural tropical landscapes are agroforestry farming landscapes, um, and millions of people, uh, some estimates suggest it's 1.2 billion of people are estimated to rely or use agroforestry farming worldwide. So it's a, it's a big challenge. And then questions have been raised on how you could do that. How could you combine all these targets at the landscape scale in the context of FLR? And there was a recent paper and that was published by De et al. in 2021. And you, you probably have seen it. So the 10 golden rules for restoration. How do you formally go for the steps to implement restoration at the landscape scale? And I put them out here because I thought it might be quite good to see them all together. And I will only point out two things, these two, because they, they actually are the ones that address some of the criticism that come from social scientists and political ecologists that are keen to point out that you need to include um, our local communities and uh, well-being uh, at the core of the restoration process in design not just as an afterthought during implementation stage, but also during the planning stage. 
And these two of the 10 goal rules uh, to some extent address some of the concerns of, of these social scientists and political ecologists. And this is where our research sits now. And I point that out here because if you think about trees, uh, whether this is in forests near farms or trees on and around farms, they can provide services and less of this, this is often what is highlighted, like being pollination, you know, being water regulations, prevention of soil erosion, microclimate buffering, all these things. And these are the benefits that are often quite talked about. Uh, they often forget that there are also costs. Uh, these costs are incurred uh, to the people that farm the land that are neighboring the trees or the forests. And that could be because you could get more pests, you could get uh, wildlife that damages your crops. You might have a spillover of diseases. Trees uh, might go, um, uh, incur shade which some crops might not like, so they have less yields, and uh, you might just have less land to grow your crops. So these are important costs that need considering. Uh, they're also called disservices. So with our project, the Acquisis Tanzania, what we wanted to do is, well, how do you now find solutions to that challenge, right? How do you get the human well-being and the ecological well-being together into the restoration design? So we asked these questions, why should we restore? Um, so looking at ecological benefits, but now putting the well-being benefits really equal to that on the same level. And then yes, climate change benefits uh, in terms of trees, storing carbon, good for uh, carbon storage targets. Um, and then the next question uh, we asked is who do we need to restore for? Uh, so global mapping, um, you know, research projects, what they often do is calculate biodiversity and carbon benefits at global scale, thinking about planetary boundaries and the earth and the benefits on the global scale, but a lot of the costs are incurred at the local scale and the benefits might not necessarily be relevant for immediate livelihood concerns. So that needs considering. And then, of course, uh, restoring for wildlife and for people. And then the third question was, how can we restore? So what? which trees, for example, then and where. So where in the landscape should we restore the trees? Should we separate, have highly intensified cropland and then the forests nearby? Do we plant the trees on the farms, around the farms? What are the trade-offs in terms of services and disservices? And then if, if we have come up with a, a plan, how do we mitigate any negative impacts on, on people or wildlife? So this was a big questions that we faced at the start. Here I show um, our case study landscape where we try to sort of answer these questions to start with. Um, in terms of, it's quite small if you want, it's like, you know, 15 kilometers, you can here see the scale. It's about maybe that whole landscape here as shown is 30 kilometers by 30 kilometers. What you see in, in the dark green is a forest. So we have some mountain forests, in the picture here shown. And then you have um, in the valley, so the, a crop production landscape where you have a lot of smallholder farmers that to some extent practice agroforestry. When you have a large scale industrial farm here in the north, which is farmed by uh, a South African industry farm, farm company. And then you have to the east more the woodlands, again, natural areas, which are um, savannas of the Zulu. So quite complex landscape. Uh, lots of interests, uh, lots of stakeholders. And we are using, uh, wanted to use a coupled human and natural systems approach where we say, okay, we have the ecological processes and dynamics shaping where animals go, what habitat dependency they have, how they create, uh, interfere, how ecological processes basically create services like water flows, hydrology, carbon sequestration, and we have the human processes and dynamics which is management of the landscape for farming, uh, for livestock. And of course, acknowledging that these two interact with each other and shape each other. So as a project itself, I introduce the key people. Um, that is uh, myself, obviously. <laughs> and then there is Professor Susanna Salu. She sits in Leeds. She is the social scientist on the team. Um, heading all that stuff. Then we have Esther Kyoko from um, National Museums in Kenya. She is an insect expert and we needed her to help us with insect identification and understanding how insects interfere or interact with crops 
in particular and uh, how we link with the natural habitats subsequently. Then Dr. Dio Shirima, he is from the Coin University of Agriculture in Tanzania. And he's a, an ecologist by training, but also quite really good with logistics and translation. But he's helping a lot with understanding local conditions uh, in terms of ecology and interactions between people and wildlife. And then there is Andy uh, from the University of Sunshine Coast Australia, and he is a co-director of the NGO Reforest Africa, who do a lot of tree restoration activities in the landscapes, or at least plan for them. So they are important to be on board. And then what we came up with is a very simple drawing like this, and I will talk you through it. So we thought like, okay, what's important is, oh, uh, it's the distance to natural habitats, um, that distance, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but here that distance will affect how many insects you find on the cropland, for example, that do pollination or that are acting as pests. When you want to look at how many of these there are, whether there are trade-offs to affect crop yield and health. And then we thought about the social components here in red and yellow. So this would be like uh, pest control, what techniques do they use, uh, whether it's chemicals or natural pest control, other mitigation measures, and how this is influenced by the well-being of people and also their wealth, which is often an important factor. And then we thought if we have this right, then we can plan uh, how would intervention like tree planting or whatever interfere with that system, with the dynamics. Now that was a very simple system. And then we thought that's too simple. Um, we should probably um, make that a little bit prettier. <laughs> and that was our first attempt at making it prettier and more accessible. And what you can see here on the x-axis is um, a scale, is a scale dependency of different processes. So we had the regional and national scale where we uh, put in place the external drivers and interventions like uh, a conservation NGO comes and wants to restore forests in the landscape, that's an external driver. Uh, also environmental conditions like say topography or soil. And then in the, at the next scale or below that is the landscape scale before like, okay, these, these factors affect things like landscape management, which is more of a social process and driven by different factors. And they, landscape management and environmental conditions will interact to affect natural capital and landscape configuration. That then at the farm level affects services and disservices, benefits and costs, and at the individual level will incur socio-ecological uh, and uh, ecological well-being outcomes. So this was our big plan. And then we had our, obviously a hypothesis because we wanted to get it funded and certain outcomes we wanted to test for. And then we submitted that to the BBRSC and, and we got funded to do all that. And when, once we started to think about it a little bit more, it got more complex because obviously there's lots of interrelationships between these different components of the landscape and the different expected drivers. And this is what we came up with. And I, again, will talk you through it a little bit step by step because it's quite a complex figure. So first of all, I wanna point out this one, that's landscape configuration. It's quite a central component in our research. We think it's very important. And the reason being um, uh, uh, that landscape configuration uh, plays a central role in, in determining their biodiversity in the landscape besides. So species don't just have a big species distribution range, they have certain habitat dependencies so at landscape scales, how they use the landscape, it will differ. And we have shown that in the biofrag research, like in uh, lots of papers in nature and science. So we know that species have very different responses to forest fragmentation, to different habitats and their fragmentation in the landscape. And these species may have different functions. So they might be pollinators, they might be seed dispersers, they might be pests, they might be pest control species. But because they all have different responses, it's very difficult to actually, without taking the data for it um, uh, or collecting the data for it, to know what would happen at a landscape scale if you restore a certain habitat. And I can show you that complex figure. You might remember it from the talks I gave in the past on the Biofrag project. In very simple terms is that we say, okay, um, a species 
look at the landscape and perceive landscapes as a continuum of resource availability. I don't say this is the, in most, in most cases, do not say this is the forest, this is a cropland and I'm choosing, or sometimes I live in the forest and then I occasionally venture out, they see a continuous resource gradient and uh, then use the landscape accordingly to maximize their resource availability. And this is what we try to capture with that biofurb metric. Um, and what we found very clearly, and this is like, it was a massive effort in terms of data sets, is that a lot of data are biased. So actually we don't know how many species use goblins because we only ever measure in forests. And I'm just as guilty of that as, any, as most other ecologists. And uh, when we arrived at our case study landscapes, the natural tendency of, of all as ecologists was to go first into the forest and see what's there. Uh, uh, until uh, farmers and here also Dio, our core clearly said, no, 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 we need to now focus on the croplands and it's time to place the croplands in the center and then have the forest and the trees around it as almost as a side factor. And what we wanted to know is which species show which response to which resource and how do trade offs in terms of the traits that the species have and the services and disservices they provide how they play out in core production landscape. So I put a couple of pictures here of the animals that uh, I will talk about in this, in this in these slides, like this could be like predators, whether it's birds or mammals or seed eaters, birds, or this cane, uh, cane rat, which is naked damaging crops, basically key crops in the landscape. And this is not new, right? I'm not coming up with something totally novel. Uh, this is like well established in the literature. Lots of people have been working on it especially in Göttingen and Schanke at all, like they have published on landscape moderation of biodiversity patterns and processes and how that interlinks with crop, crop, crop productivity, crop yield and crop health. So I want to start with that one. So if I go back just a moment, so this is a complex figure that we came up with, right? And we said, okay, yeah, Blend out uh, some of these aspects now and focus on landscape configuration, ecological community, and the services and disservices this ecological community provides. And this is a map of how we approach the sampling of that in our case study landscape, just to get these pathways parameterized. So we uh, looked at land species. You can see here Kayombo um, uh, identifying tree species and also thinking back about the crops, uh, the crop um, production sites he sampled, uh, basically noting down what species he finds from, from herbs. So the ground vegetation layer to the trees that you might find around farms. We had Laura and uh, uh, other people teaching uh, and training people on how to set up camera traps. Evodius has been leading a lot of the camera trapping in the landscape. You can see here, I think it's a triangle where we have placed these camera traps in the landscape. Mostly we focused on forest edges and the rest in the, in the farmed land. Then we uh, did bird service in quite a lot of points in the farmed land and along the forest boundaries. And we measured a lot of other things like soil, crop health, insects. And what we then did is, okay, if we can, if we have this data, can we now use them to map, because that would be quite useful, map biodiversity outcomes, to map crop health outcomes. And the way we have for now started to approach parameterizing and modeling that pathway is using linear discriminant analysis. It's like a bit like a classification algorithm if you work on land use classification. So first we used some greedy works function in R where we said, okay, which, which predictors should we keep is all landscape configuration predictors, right? For example, forest percentage in a window or distance to river, distance to road, distance to forest. And once we have uh, identified the predictors, predictors that are most important, then we put them into LDA models um, with a training and validation data set and then said, okay, find me the best fitting model. And then we used that best fitting model to predict for each pixel in the landscape. For example, the presence or the probability of finding a threatened mammal or the probability of finding a high number of plant and seed eating birds. It worked quite well. Um, different landscape configuration variables have different effects on biodiversity metrics. I just explained the first one you can see here. 
if you have a higher force percentage and higher distance to road, you can have a higher probability of seeing a pregnant mammal. And uh, if the distance to river is lower and distance to forest is lower, you also have a higher probability of threatened mammals. And then if you map that, you get maps like this, uh, which is incredibly useful for us because now we can see, okay, where in the landscape are we going to find certain kind of um, biodiversity matrix and biodiversity outcomes. So that, that seemed to work. We have started to do that. And then the second one we wanted to parameterize was the link from landscape configuration to microclimate. So from theory, we knew, we, uh, I think uh, it's quite well established now and, and fairly well known that if you have trees, they provide shade. So it, there is a microclimate buffering effect that comes from forests and that gets increasingly uh, uh, weaker, that buffering effect if you have more degraded or disturbed forests. So that's from the literature. It's most often in the past, it would have been implemented on forest habitats along a disturbance gradient. So we now also went into to the croplands where you just have my single trees or couple of trees. And so we did that uh, systematically and we uh, tried to see what is that microclimate effect from the trees on the farmed land. Um, and we also try to think of that in terms of, okay, if you have landscape configuration affecting microclimate, we will see, and there is evidence for that from the literature, effects on biodiversity. And here I just show a study I was involved in with Mike uh, from the Safe Landscape actually, where he looked at the temperature tolerance of some ant species and, and how it changes or how it affects how ants respond to uh, hotter climates because in a disturbed forest, you have more open canopies, it gets hotter on the ground. And then it turns out that yes, the species uh, have different adaptations to these different microclimates. And if you change microclimates because of uh, having less trees, you will change ant communities. And he uh, showed in his analysis that what you get is more herbivores ants and less carnivore ants if you have hotter climates. And that then, of course, for trophic network control will affect other ecosystem processes, which are relevant for crop production landscapes. Um, what we also did, like just check, we basically measured ground surface temperature, leaf surface temperature of crop um, under different canopy closure, and then to wanted to see is there a strong effect or a weak effect. And what these figures show here is just some first insights. So what you can see on the left hand side is that uh, of course you get the buffering effect. So if you have closer canopies in blue, um, you get a uh, lower surface temperatures on the ground or on the leaves of the crops. If you have open canopies like in pink, you get a uh, much higher temperatures, even up to 50 degrees Celsius. And then this buffering effect from the trees is different if you have clear sky, that's this clean on the left hand side, or if you have an, over, an, an overcast sky. And from the literature, we know that heat uh, is quite important for crop yields. It, there's lots of studies from the US that show that uh, if you have more heat stress on the plants, that can strongly reduce the crop yield. And of course, the crop yield is what's important for people. So that, that was parameterized. We have some equations for that. And what we then started to focus on is this part. So land management, so social aspects, right? So perceptions on natural features and well-being. And that's where it becomes quickly complicated. So the so assumption is we have landscape configuration services and disservices affecting human well-being. And in order to, to get to analyze that, it's it's uh, you need to measure human well-being. And it turns out that's quite difficult. <laughs> so we used household service to start with to, to get a clips on that. And we, we were aware of some context like elephant conflict insect pests. And then we used a recently introduced uh, protocol uh, for measuring human well-being in, in any landscape really, uh, and it's meant to be robust. So we had Robin Loveridge, he, he came to Newcastle and he helped us design a, a locally specific human well-being measurement protocol. So we thought about this hard and long for a couple of days. And then uh, uh, we came up with some questions uh, that we wanted to ask. And as I say, some, uh, it's basically, it turned out to be a one hour interview per household. 
But then what happened is that we went to the field site and then talked to our social research assistants, which are all Tanzanians. And we had to adapt quite a lot of the questions, uh, which is partly due to language differences and partly due to the difference of how local communities perceive what, what, what is nature, what are natural habitats, what are natural capital benefits, um, um, what are good species, bad species, things like that. So it took a lot of effort to get to a final protocol we could use to then implement our household surveys. And then the household service basically is um, a lot of questions and these can then be put into quantitative metrics to calculate human well-being along five dimensions that's material well-being, health, social security and freedom. And here I show a graph just some outcomes from 458 surveys. Seems to be quite the same for males and females which is good. Uh, uh, and I also put some uh, questions that have been asked about diet diversity and yield. So I show here some of the questions. It's a massive protocol, right? Uh, it's, then the, our team, uh, shown here, Lily and Baraka and Shofway, when they went out to do the household surveys, uh, they had to ask a lot of questions and they had to, to enter it all into tablets. And then Sergio then, so I can't say too much about how he did it. <laughs> it seemed very complicated, but basically he then converted that into, into continuous matrix that you can actually put into analysis in the quantitative framework to calculate well-being. And we did that uh, here, you see again, it's quite similar the distribution of well-being amongst the households. There are some differences and it's the only significant difference is that females um, seem to have uh, less well-being than males, uh, which is not surprising for co-production landscapes in rural Tanzania. So what happened in terms of the whole data collection? In November 2019, we started. Uh, I was quite excited back then. We had big ambitions and we went out, uh, we trained our team, uh, really lovely people, really highly efficient workers. We, uh, they were, some of them were more like uh, BSc graduates, some of them were local people helping us with ecological data collection. We met stakeholders in industry uh, to get their narratives on what's important in the landscape how much crop they want to produce, how we could sustainably intensify it. We met uh, the agricultural extension officers, which are government employees, to get their opinions because we have a bit of a wider picture on the landscape. And then we started to implement our sampling protocols. And then, then came the floods. That was like three, four months later. Not, not totally surprising because it, it was the start of the rainy season. It made data collection a little bit more complicated. And then after the floods came COVID, <laughs> so we had a very extended break in terms of field work. So in terms of what's the status of the data collection, we have like, let me just put that up so I don't make a mistake. Yes, 72 of the 132 plant plots we have sampled. We have yield data for some of these plots, uh, uh, not for all of them. We have done 124 bird survey points and 32 camera trapping points and 458 household surveys. So it's not too bad, it could be better. So what I show here is really just some pilot data because obviously we don't have the full data set. It's a bit unbiased sampling design so far, but we have used what we have to, to bring them together to show what kind of, how you could use this data to, to plan restoration, including stakeholders in your restoration planning. So what we have done is uh, uh, we said, okay, if you want to go to that landscape, let's do a restoration scenario now, right? Um, that restoration scenario has been informed by some plants by IUCN and they, they want to plant trees around riverine areas to, to prevent soil erosion and flooding. So, what we said is, okay, take all the creeks, digitize them. We had to do that by hand because they're quite difficult to distinguish on satellite images. And then just simulate a, a forest there, say it's a forest, and then simulate canopy closure parameters that are realistic for the landscape for these restoration buffer zones. And then use our predicted, our pathways that we modeled already to predict some outcomes for the landscape in terms of, say, biodiversity, 
or ecosystem services and disservices. And this is what you see here. So basically uh, uh, created new landscape configuration variables like distance to forest will have changed because we have more forest. Uh, the amount of forest in a 250 meter window will have changed because we have more forest. We will have different canopy closure variation in the landscape because uh, we have more forest. So this new Kobayat raster, I used that with the models we had created on current status to predict for the future, what would the biodiversity look like under the restoration scenario before any tree has been planted, right? And this is what you see here. You can see, of course, for threatened mammals under, right? like, that's not surprising, right? The threatened mammals, they are in the forest before, and they will hopefully then use the restored habitats. You get more threatened mammals, which is nice, but they are concentrated in the forest habitats. And we did the same for just, I just showed two examples. We have plenty more and we will publish that. Here I show it for the number of plant and seed eating birds with on the left hand side before the restoration intervention and on the right hand side afterwards, there is some increases on that. And uh, but it's, it's difficult to say, uh, will this be pests or will these be beneficial for dispersing some important plants? Uh, most likely they will be pests. <laughs> So that's quite important consideration if you look at the crop production landscape where these birds will increase in terms of diversity. And then obviously what's far more interesting for the, for the, from a farmer's perspective is the disservice. So where do the pests go under a restoration scenario? And there's, uh, I don't have all the insect data yet. They are still being identified. Um, it, this is slower even because of COVID access to labs. So it's all done in Kenya. And uh, we have some projects running on uh, uh, pollinator pest interactions in terms of insects. So that's Joseph doing that kind of project. Here I just show a quick uh, picture of his work. He has planted some okra plants. He's doing some experiments. So it, this is more slow going. And this is the most important results that I wanted to show. So what we have uh, taken opportunity of is a um, of the Southern Tanzania Elephant Program, that's an N uh, NGO as well, it's a step NGO. And what they have been measuring is crop damage by elephants. So they have uh, been regularly recording crop damage incidents in the landscapes in seven villages. And what, uh, we have used the data with landscape configuration parameters to see, well, can you use landscape configuration to predict current risk of conflict, and yes, we can. You can see here in red, bear that conflict primarily occurs. You can see um, uh, not so much on the sugarcane farm, but very much in the smallholder farms in the villages near that Macombera forest. So the elephants come from the Salou into Macombera forest, then go out uh, and damage crops. And then we used our restoration scenario with um, where, where the trees are, these, these linear structures to see, well, would that change the conflict? And uh, it seems not so much. If you were to look at it at plot level, you can definitely see that there is an increase uh, in some of the plots uh, in terms of damage risk, but there's also a decrease in other plots. So that's reassuring. So basically these are more useful maps now because we can use them in conversation with the stakeholders and the key stakeholders here are the farmers. How would you do that? So we take inspiration from, from that study here. So Johansen and Niskren in 2017, they worked further south in Tanzania. And what they did is they went to a landscape that has an industry farm and they asked the villagers, well, how do you see the current landscape? How does it, how do you perceive it? So they were drawing all these things like there's a train and then there's a helicopters the village and the people and the, the industry buildings uh, and then a lot of livestock. And then they asked them afterwards, well, how, how do you want to see the future for your landscape where you live? And that's what you can see here on this right hand side. And you can see that they would like the wildlife to re be retained or to come back, including the elephants. So there seems to be quite positive perceptions of wildlife and natural capital. They want to restore the trees along the river habitats, reduce the pollution. They don't want all these fires that seem to occur. And more importantly, they want more say, they want more incorporation into the decision-making of the industry farmer. So that 
and then they basically used all the stakeholder workshops narratives that they, they that were crystallizing to come up with a figure on how things are interlinked, which looks fairly similar to ours, which was based on, on the literature. So that's good to see as well. So we thought we can do that too. So first of all, we checked, okay, people's perceptions of nature as being important for their livelihoods. Can we see that in our data? And we can, and it's higher if a household well-being is higher. So that means in brief that if farmers have lower well-being and were women, they were less likely to see nature as being important for their livelihoods. We did not find any effect of crop damage or elephant damage or perceptions of elephant damage risk in terms of people's well-being or in terms of their perceptions of nature's value. And that's also good because that means they would actually be quite open to restoration interventions. And then when it came to that aspect, uh, uh, we thought, okay, how what factors are important? Then you now go to the farmer and ask that farmer, where would you plant that tree? Or what by years do you see or constraints to planting trees? This is led by Eleanor. She is a PhD uh, candidate with us in our lab. And, um, and it works also with Susie, obviously, because she's a social scientist. She knows far more than me about social language and social frameworks that can be used in that context. And uh, if I wanted to put that in a language that might be more accessible is what trees do you want, if any, and where do you want them and why? This is, this, this is what we wanted to know. In order to define what restoration interventions actually are realistic from a social perspective, and then we could use that in our models to predict what would happen to biodiversity and crop conflict. And if we then take that, take that back to the farmers, would that change their, their behavior or their decision-making on what trees they would want or where they would want them? And this is basically uh, what currently happens. We are currently running workshops despite COVID. We have a very capable local team of social scientists with Lily again and Baraka and also led by a um, Frances, who is Tanzanian, and they are running workshops with remote um, collaboration by Eleanor and Margarita. And they are doing two things. They want to understand how small the farmers envision what futures they want for their farms and for the surrounding landscapes. Where would they ideally want to see forests and trees? And then also, they want, we want to co compare that so to what does it currently look like and what do you think is needed to get you to your future vision. And this is currently happening, just a quick snapshot into it. You can see how farmers see the landscapes in the Kilimbaro Valley, where they see the trees, how they want to see them. We see differences between villages, so we do it in different villages. And we will look at that, but it depends on where the village is located in terms of distance to forest and crop conflict risks, because that's important for the farmers. And it seems to be, you know, it's the first narratives that come out is, first of all, they want more information from scientists. And we have created a lot of leaflets based on the research we have been finding, the species we find, the insects we find, some uh, information on how to control them. So they find that very useful. But they also say, uh, provide a lot of context for what's preventing them from, from restoring trees. And there's things about ownership of trees or trees being destroyed by someone else after they were planted. So a lot of questions that need addressing at some point for the restoration design and process. So what does this all now mean in terms of, because I promised like, wait, right, what's better bottom up, top down? What does it all mean in terms of setting restoration priorities. But first of all, we think that people should use that framework because it shows how complex the processes are at the landscape scale. We think it's a robust structure now for identifying what data you would need to collect to monitor local interpretations of the outcomes, ecological outcomes and human well-being outcomes. We think because it's spatially explicit and you could use any kind of model right, to parameterize the pathways. If you feel you could do a better job using IBMs, individual-based models or structured equation, whatever you want to use, you could do that. 
and it allows you to predict likely consequences of the tree restoration planning before any trees are planted. And then you can take that with you to the farmers or to different stakeholders and say, well, given these outcomes, would you change anything in your approach? Would that alter your decision making? And you then iteratively go through that process to identify the best way of approaching restoration. As I said, the modeling can be as complex as required. You could include interaction of species, networks, governance management rules, but well, it's important to have indicators in place to monitor the effectiveness of the restoration after you started it. And then uh, maps, we believe maps are the way forward. They can form the base from which to identify opportunities for knowledge exchange, for capacity building, and uh, to identify if there are, say, uh, more risks in terms of crop damage, say, because there would be more elephants moving through the landscape, what is the mitigation techniques you would find acceptable? And they have to be designed and identified with the local communities. And then they will be informed by the tolerance of different communities to certain conflicts. And we are doing that. So I highlight that here we have a new project out is Core is funded by SNAP, where we look at that evidence uh, and the interactions with the stakeholders specifically for elephants and um, elephants moving through crop production landscapes or large wildlife uh, with the potential for upscaling. Um, we have other projects like mammoths and habitat use, obviously, and uh, to improve our models, not just LDA models. Uh, same for sugarcane, we, want, we would need to know what's the potential for yield in that landscape based on soil and water, and how would you need to manage any negative impacts, pests, large elephants, and then the biggest question, and that is uh, one that it comes back again and again, is what's about the governance in land use? It's such an important driver. And we believe that our first approach is use a robust framework and test it in different landscapes in different parts of the tropics to see, do they all respond differently? Do we have, do they respond differently or is there patterns with governance and management structures? Or uh, is it really, just a wide mess. So it's a, basically, if you implement a framework in different environments, in different uh, countries, under different governance and management systems, you might be able to identify whether some commonalities exist or patterns which you can then, you know, start planning for. Just a picture of uh, from the starting process. So it's not just me, it's a huge uh, project, lots of people involved, a collaboration between Kenya, Tanzania and the UK. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. It's fascinating to see all your work and diverse activities uh, in that landscape. And so we can move over to the Q&A now. I encourage, if you're comfortable, any of the audience wishes to switch their camera on. It's nice to have some faces in the audience during, during the uh, Q&A. Uh, and would anyone like to kick off with some questions? Uh, I'll kick off with one while we're waiting for people to formulate. Uh, I was curious about this uh, relationship between a uh, perception of nature and well-being that, uh, that people with lower well-being, particularly females, uh, had uh, less perception of the value of nature. Um, what, what, what do you want to untangle that a little bit? What do you think? Is it simply that there's, there's more day-to-day -day subsistence so that they simply don't have uh, it's, see any it's value? It's, it's difficult to, to say without going back, like we, obviously we can formulate some hypothesis around that. It would need validating in conversations with, with the stakeholders, farmers themselves. So the well-being uh, is, um, so, so women are doing most of the farming. They do a lot of the decision-making on the farm and you know, like all these processes, but we also raise the kids. We also wanna make sure the kids have education. There, there's other things like uh, planning where the money comes from. So for them, it, they might be far more aware of all the limitations that are taking away from them time. So their, their perception of how nature contributes to that likelihood is probably lower just because there's a lot of different direction that it takes them. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to speculate further than that. <laughs> But it's very complex. Like the well-being itself was not calculated, taking into account perceptions of nature. So that's that's we 
are independent parameters so we were allowed to model their relationships which which is at least reassuring <laughs> okay any more questions alex hi th thank you can you hear me okay my, my you're a bit quiet yeah. is it all right no yeah you just about like you're out because yeah there's just... Hold my... um, but yeah, thanks for that um, presentation and it, 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 that was a lot of challenges that you had to face and it was already an ambitious project, so well done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, I, so I guess, you know, I have like lots of questions. I think, it, I think it's, there's a lot in there for sure. Um, I, I suppose in terms of, to, I guess to ask you to reflect a bit, I mean, um, you, you focus kind of, or you haven't really focused, say, shall we say, like on a specific crop, right? It's kind of the landscape and what are, what are different um, manifestations, different influences, ecological and social. You know, how, how have you, how is that, have you managed that? I guess it sounds like you have a few maybe smaller projects on specific crops or, but has that been kind of a challenge or how to overcome that? It, it was a huge challenge at the start. So what, what we thought we would do is have a lot of food and cash crops that are important um, in, in Tanzania, in specifically in the Kilombaro Valley. So the Kilombaro Valley is a wetland area. So it's quite that, uh, uh, and traditionally in the past would have grown maize, so corn, rice, um, yeah, mostly rice and some smaller crops like okra, pumpkin, things like that. So we came in there and thinking, oh yes, that's good because you know some of them are pollinator limited, some of them not, so we can compare them. And, and we also had a clear design, there's a tree or forest, and then there's a cropland, like in the UK, you know, and so it's easy to implement a clear sampling design, it wasn't the case. And we had to sort of reevaluate once we were there. Um, there's a lot of sugarcane. Uh, the sugarcane industry farm takes a lot of land. And the rice has expanded a lot, um, partly due to in international investment to produce more crops for local farmers and improve their well being. So these were poverty alleviation measures. So we had these, these stresses on the system. And then what the sugarcane company is currently doing is trying to expand. So they are trying to get the smallholder farmers to convert and produce sugarcane for them. So they're trying to increase their outputs. And the smallholder farmers, they grow mostly cassava increasingly because that's considered by Tanzania as a drought resilient crop. And they still grow to some extent like other plants, but we basically then had to whittle down and we came up with sugarcane in the decision-making maize, uh, pumpkin and okra. So some pollinator limited and some not. <laughs> and we thought like if we start before, so that would be a good start. So these are the crops we're using. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. That's really interesting. <laughs> uh, okay, Kate Parr has a question. She can't turn the mic on, so I'll read it out. Uh, I wanted to ask if you are sampling the surrounded forest agricultural areas. Is there potential for problems with the baseline given that the valley is mostly non-forest, like floodplain grassland? How would you reconcile tree planting with this? Let me read it. Ba, 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 ba. This, yeah, is it a? Is this oh, a I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so there would have been woodlands before. So basically, not all of it. So we are at the, at the northern edge of the of the valley. It's a, it's a wetland area. Say that. So we are at the northern edge. So you have the Salu on the east, which is our savanna. When you have Magambara forest, the triangle that you've seen where a lot of the conflict was surrounding it, that is like a triland, lowland forest, a little bit moist. And then you have the valley that would have been, so there was forest clearing going on in the past, but it wouldn't have been a dense humid forest necessarily, right? And then you get uh, in the mountains, you get this more humid rainforest, mountain forest. So we are measuring in all the natural habitats that would have been existing there in the past. Where exactly these natural forests would have been, say, in where the sugarcane is now, is, is very difficult to reconstruct. I mean, obviously, some of it would have been natural grassland, and we do measure in natural grassland what, what insects are going there, what birds and mammals, and what does the plant health, or how hot do they get, and stuff like that. But uh, we, we are capturing processes in the riverine forests, which would have been there in the past, and in the, in the, in the lowland forests which were more extensive. If you go back to the landscape, if I was bringing up a map again, um, I, I will not even try that now. <laughs> it's like uh, there are forest patches left, right? So the villages still have forest resources that they left uh, and that they're still using and they are being degraded because uh, communities use 
use of trees as poles, um, as firewood, things like that. And there are plantations. So uh, there was a government intervention of planting teak. So you have a couple of teak patches uh, and they believe it's good in terms of timber revenue. So it's not entirely just that land and lots of, you know, but it can get very bad still in the north. As you've seen, it gets flooded in the rainy season. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, she says thanks. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, and what's the what's the dynamic between this more agro-industrial farm and, and and the smallholders? You're saying that the the farm is the industrial farm is trying to expand expand benefits out to the smallholders in terms of income and livelihoods, but is there also tension? Are these traditions? What was the land before this farm came in? Was it partially traditional farmland or was it all semi farmland? It, it would have been. Uh, I would be lying if I knew exactly the year when the sugar, so it's a, when the South African industry farmer came in, but it's, it's, it's a couple of decades probably, or like 15 years or something. Mm -hmm. But um, what I, for wider context, there's a severe land shortage, obviously, right? There's a mountain forest, you can't go in, there's a national park, totally not allowed. Then you have Sisalu, you shouldn't really go in there, it's also protected. And then in the north, you have Mikumi, which is a national park, can't go there. So there's this parcel of land where this prime co production landscape, right? And then you have a lot of smallholder farmers, you have increasing population growth. The government in Tanzania has a Kilimo Kwanzaa strategy, that means agriculture first. So it's an agricultural co corridor, and they want to invest heavily into that. They were encouraging international investors into the area, and they still do, to plant crops. So that industry farmer is there and they have converted natural habitats, but it's not as if they, I wouldn't say they came in and just took the land, right? There is benefits to smallholder farmers to some extent. I don't know what was before they came, whether there was tension or whether they, the government intervened in terms of land buying. But it's a moment there is no, at least, from what I, when I looked at the narrations that come out of the workshops, there isn't a tension with the sugarcane farmer. Uh, so what the sugarcane industry currently tries to do is two things. They're trying to do community work and they are quite aware of sustainability questions. They have restored some trees along the rivers, limited extent, but with exotic trees, mind, <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't be perfect. But what, what's more worrying is now because of the land shortage, the expansion plans, and how they interfere with potential plans for restoring trees like elephant movement corridors, riverine habitats, like, you know, so that's where the tension now becomes. So this work is really important to get right, right now. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Esther Kyoko, you have a question there? Would you like to ask it directly or? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Esther. <laughs> uh, I can I can answer straight away. Okay, so the, the question well, are, are there some other side? Yeah. Right, Esther, can do you want to ask it directly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Marion, for that wonderful presentation. I just wanted to find out whether on the ground there are any initiatives by the government or other NGOs to protect the existing forests. Thank you. So just for everyone here, this is Esther. She's a Kauai on the project. She's our entomology expert. <laughs> um, in terms of, yes, so thank you for reminding me. The Macombera Forest Triangle is now a reserve, thanks to Andy. So he has campaigned and worked very hard to get it into protection status. And that obviously means that farmers will be limited in terms of access for extracting timber resources or firewood. There is um, uh, the national parks that I mentioned, and then the restoration uh, plans that exist for the landscape include river forest and elephant movement corridors. These are still, you know, sort of planning stage. The so elephant movement corridor, perhaps more at implementation stage. The so elephant movement corridor is planned to have a big fence around it. So that means cutting off people from it, but also preventing large elephants going out in the croplands. So it has two sites that need a certain careful consideration, I guess. And the existing forest, yes, um, there are village forest reserves which are not protected per se, 
but it's we are managed by the village communities and they still exist. So to so hope is <laughs> that they'll continue. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Sophia, would you like to ask your question? If not, I can relay it. Uh, what are some of the natural pest control mechanisms currently de de deployed? <laughs> That's a very good question, and uh, not many. Um, you would think that so because the stakeholder farmers have always been in the landscape world like for a very long time, that there would be a lot of traditional knowledge being passed from farmer to farmer. It seems to get lost over time. Um, a lot of the farmers try to use chemicals, but they don't know very much about them. So it's very difficult. So they and they do say that they want uh, what they really need and want is a training farm that tells them how to use different pest control solutions. And they would happily go along with a nature-based solution because that would be if it's free, right? <laughs> Chemicals cost a lot of money and the farmers are very cash strapped. So they, if, you, if they can avoid spending money, they will if they have some knowledge. What we are trying to do is um, we basically looked at the literature and there is a tree called neem tree. It's used, I think, in our landscapes. It's a natural biopesticide. There's some other tree species. And it's located further to the east is a training farm. It's, um, uh, you know, they, they show farmers how to use biopesticides extracted from trees and neem tree was one of them. It doesn't, isn't, it's not necessarily grown yet in the landscape, but we are exploring the potential of them. Can it grow there? Would farmers use it? And how do you, that's a more complicated way. <laughs> how do you extract from the tree the, the biopesticide to apply to your crops? Because it seems like talking to, and I talked to some people about that, is that you need, you need to, the tree will produce different uh, concentrations of a biopesticide depending on where it grows, the soil and the nutrients it gets. So you would have to plant the trees, do some trial experiments, extract and then see how much actually you need to extract from the leaves to get the biopesticide that is sufficient to treat the crop pests. But that's the biggest, I think, the potential lies in that tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, fascinating. Uh, Alex, I'm presuming that your hand is an old one. So let me know if it's a new question. Uh, otherwise, uh, over to Tina. Yep. Um, thanks, Marion, for your talk. Um, I think it's very interesting to sort of see an integrated model that doesn't have any sort of carbon calculation at its heart, but like actually like something that's like purely community focused. And it's very nice to see. I've got a question around the disservices. What were the biggest disservices, like the most sort of dominant that you were seeing and that like were perceived by the communities? And also, were there areas um, in your sort of your um, trade of models at the end where you sort of said restoration in this area just doesn't make sense because it's just such a big trade off? And if yes, why? It's a it's a sensitive issue, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> For different people have very high emotions when it comes to restoration activities and what they want to see restored, in particular when it comes to large wildlife. What I what I will say is that from the household surveys, what was more important was pests, insect pests. That's why ISTA is so important. That's why it's so important to get the insect data now into the models. They, they do, ex so the crop damage for large herbivores, like I showed a monkey picture at the store, like, you know, they do go in the crops, but the effect of the damage is not that big for most. The elephants, the damage is very localized. So it's certain villages and particular around Macambara Forest Reserve. Um, and this issue of how and where you should restore is highly contentious and sensitive. So the existing NGO step, I said it's an implementation stage. What they did is they, they, they started community engagement activities, lots of talks, and then we started negotiating with them where that corridor should go or could go. And that partially is informed by people already experiencing high damage, where they say, oh, well, my damage is already high, which sucks. It's really difficult to farm my despair salad. So they are more likely to sell, but it's also informed by other political factors. But they have come up with a route now where they bought the land and they want to implement that corridor. So I'll leave it at that. It's complicated. We can talk maybe <laughs> per email about that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Vivek? 
Thank you, Edwinda. Um, uh, th thank you very much for uh, this inspirational research which you have uh, carrying over. Uh, I'm a, a researcher from um, India. I'm researching uh, about soil resource conservation in MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in India in a state called Odisha, uh, uh, where I work in a remote district, uh, which is uh, more semi-arid uh, and uh, uh, landscape, um, but the uh, tree cover has drastically decreased. So my interest is uh, in your uh, study region, uh, uh, how severe is the soil erosion issues and uh, um, uh, tree cover itself is being viewed by farmers as uh, biggest disservice uh, uh, due to shading issues. Uh, besides that, uh, uh, how could we complement uh, the uh, um, uh, the usage of, of wildflower strips or uh, increasing the grass cover in the soil uh, so that uh, we could reduce soil erosion. So are there any solutions like in this direction being uh, discussed or being planned? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question, very good question. Um, we do measure in fallows and we try to, we have looked for wildflower patches that exist to get a feeling for it. Basically we look at insects on the crops and then we wanna know where they come from, right? <laughs> so we measure in all the natural habitats on semi natural habitats we can possibly find. Um, we are still being analyzed, so we don't know for sure yet. We don't have concrete results, but we try to acknowledge these wildflower patches. In terms of the trees, um, the, the reason the government has a law actually that says you have to have trees around rivers. Um, mm -hmm. The runoff from the, the soil erosion is a problem that is not measured on the ground yet. It's just modeled with this invest model. So that's what IUCN has been using and they feel it's an important problem. When you go into the landscape and you look at the waterways, um, they look quite polluted. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they don't seem healthy <laughs> and safe, but it's not measured yet. So we want to get a freshwater ecologist out next time as soon as possible to measure the water quality. Obviously that has human health implications because the farmers don't know what they apply in terms of chemicals. And if there's a runoff of these chemicals into the water streams, there's likely to be consequences for like, you know, the water goes everywhere. And the problem is that there are some larger rivers and if the creeks feed into the rivers, the rivers go south and this is where the fishing communities are. So that's, that is a big problem. So if you had trees and they would filter out any of that environmental pollution, that would be quite a good thing. So these are the things, yeah, we would consider. But fly, wildflowers, absolutely, like, you know, pollinators would, would love that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Alison, would you like to ask your question directly? Hi, uh, yes, so thank, thanks very much. It sounds like an amazing study that you're doing, so many different aspects to it. Just something you said just now about um, farmers in really degraded areas might think, well, we might as well sell up and move somewhere else, and then that could form a wildlife corridor. But where will they move to? Will they just basically chop down some better forest somewhere else? Yes, it's it's a very important question. Like it has been analyzed, right? But who's it? Patrick, Patrick Malfoy here. He raised that issue in in all these global restoration opportunities mapping and planning, where we say, "Oh, you just have to separate high intensity crop production here, so buy the farmers' land, do that here, and then have to force somewhere else." And where do they go? Right? Uh, uh, there is two aspects here. First of all, we don't know. <laughs> They, the forest a lot, so there's a land shortage across Tanzania, so they would struggle to find somewhere to go. It's not like, it's not, you know, they might likely go into marginal land, which is less good for crop production, might be savanna kind of habitats, dry woodlands, forests, or a lot of some humid forests are protected in national parks. Unlikely that they go there, um, uh, because they can't go into a national park by law. Uh, yes, huge problem. I, I it's a question that remains, right? In terms of there's other issues associated with that. If you are a smallholder farm that has a long tradition of living in a landscape and you suddenly have restoration and then your land becomes unproductive and you say, I might as well sell because there's too much damage now, um, you lose a lot of cultural history from a landscape, right? And a farmer can't, you can't just say, oh, now you go and work for the sugarcane farmer or now you go into the city and do something else because you would take that whole culture 
cultural service and cultural knowledge and cultural value out of that person's life, right? So it's lots of questions. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Sophia has another question in the chat. What carbon measurement frameworks are being used by the project, if any? Yes. Um, there is, um, we, we measure tree heights, um, we, we, are, we are using soil carbon, right, with Scotland, we mostly measure, and also in the natural habitats, we measure soil carbon, and in the forest, thankfully, Andy, and I've been involved in some of these projects, is we are measuring um, uh, carbon, or Andy is in his long-term monitoring plots, carbon stocks, uh, through traditional measurements, like, you know, what you didn't know what you're doing. <laughs> tree size, tree height in plots of one hectare and then measuring the carbon storage potential or whatever. And then use that, uh, so they, they got some money partially for the Macombara Forest Reserve Full Carbon Scheme. So they have been supported in their work through, through that NGO that sits in Leeds. I forgot the names now. So there is some plans for that. Okay, great. And uh, Kate's question made me laugh. Uh, do you consider termites as a pest? Okay, the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It depends on what function they have on the crops, right, or in the trees. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can only say that if you do exclusion experiments, that's my answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, I, I drove Kate away. Anyway, she's out. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, any more questions? Anyone? Okay, I'll, I'll just round off. Uh, can I, can I? So, so yeah, one more event. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, people who are working in these kind of sensitive uh, landscapes, uh, especially in the tropical uh, south, um, uh, do we need to call for plant breeders who could do more research about uh, shade tolerant uh, crop varieties? Uh, so that uh, uh, we could bring an optimum between uh, uh, tree cover and uh, uh, productivity as well. Thank you very much. I, I forgot that component. You asked that before, didn't you? Like part of that was part of your question. Um, so from the results that we have so far, from the trees that we have seen on the farms and crop uh, fluorescence, so we measure fluorescence of crop plants to get an indication of their productivity is no negative effect of any of the shade as currently of the trees planted on corn, sugarcane, or okra. It, we only had six plots where we have okra yield and there was a slight increase even of okra yields if there were some trees around. Why that is, I mean, there's just not enough data yet coming from the project, we're looking into it. At the moment, the only thing I would say is, is what we see in the data is that the trees that exist prevent crops overheating. So there is this temperature buffering effect. And because it can get really hot when the sun is out, that buffer effect is probably quite important. If you take that together with the climate change projections for Tanzania, that kind of adaptation to, to drought and, 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 and heat stress is probably quite an important one. So even if you had reduced yield, it, it, which we have not seen evidence for yet, but might likely will occur based on literature, that shading effect might just compensate you. But yes, about the farming and the breeding, absolutely important. Yes, if obviously, yes. Yeah, this is very new information for me. This is very encouraging uh, to learn that there is no really loss in age. Nothing. Thank you very much. At least not so far away. Right? If it come back in a year and then I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there was a little follow up from Sophia saying, uh, it's asking about your soil carbon measurement approaches. Oh God, approach. now you're putting me on the spot. Oh my God, uh, <laughs> it, will, it probably won't come back to me. It's, um, so we, we took taking the soil samples uh, in, in two layers, upper layer, lower layer, mix them together for each cropland plot at different corners of the farm, like this 20 by 20 meter plot. And it's analyzed in SUA, and it's a technique that's used by FAO. If that helps, <laughs> I would it drop me an email. I can write it in there. But because I'm not a soil scientist, I totally rely on other people 
to, to even look at so it like makes sense of the data. I looked at the data and the soil carbon is not reduced on the croplands, which might be due to how they fertilize. It's actually lower in the forest. <laughs> so that's all I can say in terms of results, what they mean and how to interpret them in the bigger context of things. I just don't know enough about soil yet and I haven't had enough time to read up or ask the soil people on the team. Okay, it's a fair, fair answer. Uh, uh, and to, just to round off, I, I was just wondering, uh, you, you've assembled this, this amazing study and uh, sending lots of information about how to understand this landscape and landscape decisions in an integrated way. Where do you see this going, say in five years, 10 years time? Do you see this, uh, who are the decision makers that you're trying, that you could use this information uh, to, to make, make landscape decisions? Are you thinking of local communities or if there are resources coming in, say for reforestation or government decisions about agricultural development? And where do you see this, this integrated understanding of this tool that you're building being, being applied? Yes. Um... That's an excellent question. I, I totally strong believer in bottom up approach. Um, I, I'm, and I, you know, I'm an ecologist. I come from forest science. I'm, I have a very strong interest in biodiversity conservation. It just doesn't work. We've seen it, right? The biodiversity declines everywhere. It's not working what we've tried so far. So now coming and protecting a forest and saying you can't go in there, that's not going to work. Just restoring forests and thinking maybe I'm going to stay there. It's not going to work. I, that's my personal opinion, right? In terms of how I want this uh, framework to be used is really is say, here we're working with the local communities to say, and parameterizing this model to predict, okay, this is what will happen under certain restoration scenarios, get the communities on board, and then take this. And then, you know, you, we still be, be doing um, uh, stakeholder workshops next on higher levels. So we will go to regional, district and national level, go to them and say, these are the narr narratives that are coming from, from that landscape. If we try it in different landscapes, these are the different narratives that are coming from these landscapes. Likely, probably similarities in some aspects and differences in others. And then this information together with some maps, we can use with national planners to say, this is how you need to plan for this region. This is how you need to plan for this region, but it has to come bottom up and then go into, if you want global like, right? But I do not believe that the approach of where you take a global map of some course resolution, biodiversity data, carbon stock data, and some economic indicators collected at national level, I do not think that this allows you to spatially delineate the right regions and the right areas to restore your trees successfully over long time scales. But that's a personal opinion, uh, you know, with the research, I want to go and have this framework applied in different landscapes to see what happens, how do communities really think, and what could what would the sustainable future at landscape scale really look like? Yeah, it's fascinating to see something driven by the bottom up, but also potentially uh, quite scalable uh, as an approach for uh, uh, quite practical I, and pragmatic. I do like hope that. that, and and remember, like you know, it's a national planners even in Tanzania, they have like there is departments for biodiversity. They have interests, but they are competing. There's the agriculture first department and the forestry department, and all these different. And you just you have to give them some evidence, and that has to come from bottom up. You can't just come with a global map and say, "Oh, look, it's really important that we restore here." But it's unlikely to work and compete with these other policies. Great. I think that's a great point to, to end on. Uh, this uh, talk will be posted onto my YouTube channel. If any of you uh, one, uh, would like to find it, just Google my name and YouTube, and you can find it there, or we'll stick it on the OCTF website next week uh, as well. Uh, finally, uh, give a round of applause. We have a tradition in this seminar to unmute your microphone. And so we actually have old school actual <laughs> audible applause. <laughs> da, 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 da. Okay, thank you. Too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, nice uh, to meet you. And thank you again, Yad Vendor. It's great. Great. Thank, thank you. And uh, thank you for rounding off uh, our, our year of, uh, of talks there as well. That's terrific. So, <laughs> Have a lovely weekend and good luck Bye. with your work in future years as well. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. bye, -bye Esther. <laughs> bye, Maria. <laughs> nice talking to you. <laughs> okay, I hope I did everything correct for you. <laughs>